scored his best result here in 1975 in a Parnelli Ford. Not a lot of people know that. must be patently obvious by now that the central position of our camera gives us an incomparably better view of the action than the side-mounted TV cameras. That's Jody Schechter's wolf leading and being passed by Patrick de Paille's Tyrrell. Carlos Reutemann diving his Ferrari inside Mario's Lotus. But Jacques Lafitte passes the lot of them in his Ligier. Isn't this the way to watch a Grand Prix? All right, we know all the drivers are playing to the camera in this practice session, but it is still terrific stuff. If only the actual racing could be like this now and again. When three times world champion Jackie Stewart drove a Tyrrell at Brands Hatch in 1978, he'd been retired from racing for five years. But he soon showed that he'd lost none of his extraordinary skills. He was fitted with a microphone for the occasion, so I'll let him talk us round the circuit. Start finishing line of this lap. Put it into fourth gear for Paddock. Off camber, left hand, a bit of weight. Put the power down in fourth gear. Break hard in the third, up into second, down into second, in for Druitt. Hugging the curb all the way round, the flag, the power, back in, straight into fourth gear from second, because it's downhill. The flag, the power, going along the bottom behind the pits, down into third gear, long left-hander, a tight, tightening corner. Carhander steers a bit, flag, the power. Side of a car breaking hard. Fourth gear now for what used to be Hawthorne's. Still need to look at fourth gear. Travel into third gear. Into third gear for this corner. Still need to go. And into fourth gear down Deer's Leap. Into third gear again for the tight right hander corner over the curb slightly. Still eating hard. Down into second gear. Lock into third gear, into fourth gear, going towards the bridge, breaking hard, into third gear. with Nigel Mansell in his Lotus. Nigel has happy memories of Brands Hatch as he won his first Grand Prix here in 1985. He also won the last British Grand Prix to be held here the following year. Both victories coming in a Williams.
Nigel never really gets going on this run. Notice how quickly the McLaren and Ferrari go by. But he gives us the chance to admire this marvellous circuit as it plunges and climbs through the woods. Most drivers loved Brands, regarding it as a real challenge, but it's now been shamefully abandoned by Formula One. Millions of pounds have been spent trying to turn Silverstone into something like a road circuit when there's one of the best right here. It's a funny old world. President Juan Perón of Argentina was a great racing fan whose influence led to the construction of this circuit, Autodrome 17th October, on the outskirts of Buenos Aires. It was completed in 1953 and the first Argentine Grand Prix was held the following year. The event continued until 1961, but the next Grand Prix wasn't held until 1972, when Jackie Stewart won in a Tyrrell. In 1974, the circuit was extended to its present length. Nelson Piquet won in 1981, the last Argentine Grand Prix to date. As we ride with Jean-Pierre Jabouy in his Renault, we can see that it's flat and featureless, with two long straights joined by this almost semicircular curve. It wasn't very demanding, but quite quick. Piquet's winning average speed in 1981 was almost 125 miles an hour. It's a surprising fact that during all the on-car laps filmed by Alain Boinard, more than a hundred, nobody spun. More's the pity, as it would probably have made pretty exciting viewing. One driver did crash, however, and it was Senor Piquet here, who'll stuff his Lotus Honda into a wall in a minute or so. Meanwhile, let's watch this triple world champion in action. Detroit was one of the few circuits that ran anti-clockwise and as we can see it was very much a stop and go affair. 
Why Formula One persisted with these city centre events in America is a mystery. They were inevitably very slow, the race average here was about 80 miles an hour, and made overtaking almost impossible, thus denying millions of American TV fans the very excitement they get from NASCAR and Indy racing. And with their concrete walls, tunnels, high wire fences and tall buildings, such circuits were very unfriendly to TV cameras. Despite this, since the demise of Watkins Glen in 1980, the USGP has been held in Dallas, Detroit, Phoenix and, heaven help us, in a car park in Las Vegas. Why this should be so when there's a truly magnificent four-mile racing circuit at Road America, Wisconsin, is yet another mystery. Oh yes, and if you're wondering about Senor Piquet's shunt, it's coming up about now. Oh well, it can happen to the best, can't it? We'll turn a blind eye to that one, Nelson. So far, all these laps have been run in the dry. Built on rocky terrain near Lisbon, the Estoril circuit hosted its first Portuguese Grand Prix in 1984, when Alain Prost won in a McLaren. Its main feature is this long 200 miles per hour straight, which has the rest of the track curling back and forth behind it. After a lap and a half to warm up his tyres, Patrick Tombe gets the Renault moving and closes up on a gaggle of cars. But it's impossible to tell what they are. Perhaps they should carry numbers on the back. But as the powers that be scarcely tolerate numbers anywhere on cars, even for the benefit of spectators, never mind TV commentators, there's little chance of that. As Tombe overtakes, we can see that he's passing his Renault teammate Derek Warwick and going after the McLarens of Alain Prost and Nicky Lauda.
for his third lap and with a clear track in front of him, Patrick is really getting into his stride. Unfortunately, at this point, we run out of film. We've just left the stadium and pits complex and we're hurtling through the pine forest towards the first of Hockenheim chicanes. Now Pironi drives flat out again, down to the off curve where there's no chicane as yet. With the aid of a cunning mix, we're in the OS curve, and that's a Ferrari in front. We're approaching 200 miles an hour here before braking for the second chicane. Now the Ferrari rockets away on acceleration, passing a Brabham on the approach to the stadium. In spite of all the bugs on our lens, this has to be the best way to watch a motor race. The central camera position on Pironi's Tyrrell gives us an unrivaled view of the action as we go in a crash that was to end his career in 1982.